joy, joy down in my heart Where? Down in my heart to stay And I'm so happy, so very happy I've got the love of Jesus in my heart Down in my heart And I'm so happy, so very happy I've got the love of Jesus in my heart What else you got? I've got the peace that passes understanding Down in my heart Where? Down in my heart Where? Down in my heart I've got the peace that passes understanding Down in my heart Let's read in the way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart. I've got the wonderful love of my blessed redeem the way down in the depths of my heart. Where? Down in the depths of my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Down in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Have you ever been tricked before? We're going to talk about someone in the Bible that was tricked today. So let's figure out who it is. Does this even work? Hey.
Hey guys, this is Adam Walsh, church planning missionary to the country of Taiwan. And like I asked the question before, have you ever been tricked before? Doesn't it just drive you nuts when somebody tricks you? They they, they conjure you into doing something that you don't want to do. And, and it's, it all sounds great and dandy until eventually you find out that what they wanted you to do was something that they usually didn't want to do because they knew it was going to cause a world disaster or something. I remember growing up, I have a little brother named Caleb. Caleb is two years younger than I am. And when we were growing up, I told you before, I we loved to ride bicycles. And this was a story before the bicycle story that I told a couple of weeks ago. This is actually before that when my brother couldn't even ride a bicycle. So he had a one of those three-wheel bicycles. You know what I'm talking about? The tricycle things that's got one huge reel in the very beginning and it's got two small wheels in the front. And what we were doing, we were riding our bikes on the porch. We had a decent sized porch. We were able to ride off or ride on the porch there. And what there was, there was a flower bed alongside the porch, right after the porch. There was no guardrails or anything. It wasn't very high up, but there was one part of the porch that if you were to, let's just say the size of your bed to the floor, that's that's basically the height of the, the, the porch down to the ground. It wasn't very big, but when you're a kid that's about, I don't know, two foot tall, then you, it's a really big drop to you. And I remember growing up watching these, these bikers as they would ride and they'd ramp and they'd do all these really cool things. And I thought, man, I want to do that. I want to be that guy. I want to ride my bike and I want to do some ramps. So I thought, hey, why don't me and my brother try to do some bicycle stunts? Why don't we try to ramp off the porch here? That'd be so cool. And, all, and everybody will be like, oh, yeah, you guys rock. And so that's what I thought was going on in my head. So I talked Caleb into and said, hey, now, listen. This is what we need to do. You you need to do this first, and then I'll follow you because I don't want to show you up. I don't want you to feel bad after I pull. I, you know, I ride my bike off here, and then ramp, and it'll be all cool and stuff. So what you gonna do is this is what you gonna get. You're gonna get on your bicycle, your three wheeler here, and then you're gonna just ride really fast, and then ride off of the porch, and you're gonna land, and it's gonna be awesome. And I remember my brother thinking, Wait, what? You want me? You want me to ride my bike off the porch? That's not. That that doesn't make sense. Oh yeah, you, you're absolutely love it. You, you need hold on. Wait, this this one second here. Uh, yeah, put this helmet on. Okay, I'll I'll take it out. Just, just just like this. That that's great. That's wonderful. All I gotta do is you put that helmet on, and then you're gonna run really fast off the porch. Okay, I, I, I'll do it. I can't see very well. That just means the helmet's working. You're gonna do great. Just do it. Just go time. Go time. Go time. Are you sure? Just okay. All right, I'll do it. You got it. Just go. Just keep going. Okay, all right, Where, which way is the, the, the side of the porch called that I'm supposed to ride off of? And I remember watching my brother, and as I was watching my brother, I was thinking, now if he survives, I'm going to do it, because if he can do it, I can do it. But I was thinking in the back of my head, if my brother does not survive, then there ain't no way in heaven I'm doing it. So I remember watching my brother, he's pedaling, he's pedaling, he's going as fast as he can, and all of a sudden, what was right off here at the porch, and just like right there, and then all of a sudden is the drop, he just went, he was, it was going to be awesome. So I could hear the music. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he didn't make it. And I remember hearing my I remember hearing my brother scream. Ah! <laughs> and then my mom and dad came running outside and they're like, what happened? How did you fall? And then Caleb's like, he tried to kill me. And that was about it for me. And then I got spankings afterwards. I realized that that is not the time to trick people. But we're going to be talking in the Bible today, Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to be talking about Satan and how he tricked Adam and Eve. Last week, we talked about God being the creator. And now this time, we're going to be talking about God that does not destroy his creation when we fall. Take a look at what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we found out God the Creator is a good God, and He's the one that calls the shots. Well, eventually we get to Genesis chapter 3, but right before Genesis chapter 3, God gives a command. He tells Adam and Eve something that they cannot do. But first He lies out, He shows them everything that He created in the garden. He says, I want you to take a look at everything that I see. Everything that you see is perfect, it's wonderful, it's great. And I want you to be sure that you can have all of it. The Bible, God was telling Adam and Eve, you can have everything that you see except for one thing. You see the tree in the middle of the garden? That is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that tree is mine. You cannot eat of it. And the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And that was a promise given by God. He wanted to put that tree there to allow Adam and Eve to make the decision that they could either choose their way or his way. And that's why they put the, the, the God put the tree in the, in the middle of the garden. He says, do not eat of it. But then we get to Genesis chapter 3. And Genesis 
Genesis chapter 3 starts off with this by saying in verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. He started to get Eve to start doubting what God had said. She said, He said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now I want you to take a look at something really quickly. The Bible says Satan was starting to tempt, he was starting to trick Eve and what she was supposed to be know what was she knew in her head that God told her not to do. And so he says, Did God really say what you think he said? Did he really say you can't eat of every tree of the garden? Now see what Satan tries to do. First he's gonna get you to doubt what God really told you to do, and then he's gonna make God look like a party pooper. He's gonna make God look like the one that's always just hammering down on you saying you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, and you can't do this. But that's not at all what God said. God said you can eat of every tree of the garden that you want. You just can't have this one tree right here, this tree of knowledge of good and evil. But Satan said, did God really say you can't eat of every tree of the garden? He's making God sound like a real party pooper, like someone that doesn't want you to have fun. And I want you to see how Eve responds to this. The Bible says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she says, in the tree in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Eventually, Eve starts thinking herself, wait a second, maybe God maybe God is a party pooper, maybe he, maybe he said, I mean, I know, and listen to what she said, I know that I'm not supposed to eat of it, then she adds words to it, making it sound like Kind of like what your mom and dad tell you. You can't go out past 10 o'clock. You can't, you, you, you have to do this. You have to be here at this time. And at first, I mean, it sounds okay, but then your friends start getting you to doubt what your mom and dad said. Did your mom and dad really say you can't be out at 10, or did they just mean you have to be back before the hour of 10 ends? And so you start thinking, well, you, you might be right. Well, hold on one second. My mom and dad said that I can't be out. They they, they said that if I'm out but, but after 10, then they're just going to destroy me. Well, your mom and dad didn't really say that, but you're starting to think, yeah, look at all these rules and regulations my mom and dad are putting on me. I I don't like this. And that's exactly what Eve's doing right here. She said, neither shall we touch it, lest we die. She's starting to make, think in her brain, well, maybe God really is a party pooper. Maybe he is someone that's just laying down the law and I can't stand it. And so the Bible says that the, then see, Satan says, you won't surely die because God knows the day you eat of the fruit, you will be as God. You will know good and evil. And you know, that's what caught Eve's attention. What caught Eve's attention as, wait a second, I get to call the shots? You mean the, the creator of the universe, he no longer will have control over me if I eat this fruit right over here? If I just eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I get to call the shots? Well, pff, bring it on. The Bible says that Adam and Eve ended up eating the fruit that they were told not to simply because they wanted to dethrone God. They wanted to call the shots. They wanted to be God. They wanted to tell the creator what they were wanting to do, and they didn't want the creator to have any not. They didn't want him to be able to tell them anything to do anymore. And that's what our problem is. That's what that's the that's the whole root of sin is that we dethrone God, we make him lower than he really is by saying we'll call the shots, we will say what's right and wrong, and you can't tell us what to do anymore because we are gods ourselves. And that's exactly what Satan wants us to get to think about ourselves. That was how Satan tricked Adam and Eve. The Bible says that when we try to dethrone God, that's what ruined the relationship. That's what broke the relationship that Adam and Eve once had with God because no longer could he have fellowship with his creation when they wanted separation from him. They didn't want God to call the shots anymore. They wanted to be separated from him so that Adam and Eve could call their own shots and God had to be over here by himself doing his own thing. And that's what sin does. It separates us. It breaks the, the, the fellowship, the bond that we once had with God. And so that's what you see afterwards though is the Bible says when God comes back and in the cool of the day as he was walking and talking with Adam and Eve beforehand, the Bible says that he came down and Adam and Eve realized that they were naked. They were hiding in the bushes. They sewed fig leaves together to make themselves apron and they were hiding in the bushes and God says, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they said, we're hiding in the bushes because we're naked. And God said, who told you that you were naked? 
Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to? Now, God knows the answer to that question, but when God asks a question, it's not for his, the answer isn't for his benefit. It's for ours. It was for Adam and Eve to start thinking, what did we do? We messed up. And so Adam says, it's Eve's fault. Eve said, it's the serpent's fault. Because God keeps his promises, the Bible says that God made a promise that sin would come into the world and death by sin. God said, the day you eat of the, free, the tree, you will surely die. That day, they did not physically die, but their spiritual bond that they had with God was broken immediately. And the Bible says that he had to place a curse on Adam and then he placed a curse on Eve. And then he placed a curse on the serpent. I want you to take a look at what he says to the serpent. The Bible said, the Lord God, in verse 14, the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. God's wanting you to understand that, that Satan himself, and it is very possible that snakes had feet until then. And God said, cursed, you'll be on your belly. You'll be eating the dust of the ground. But the main point of the entire thing of what God is saying is that God, Satan, every time, every time someone thinks about you, every time someone talks about you, it's going to be a nasty way. It's going to be a disgusting way. You're going to be the lowest of the low. Nobody's going to like you. And then I want you to take a look at what else he says. Um, and I will put enmity, a uh, separation between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, when I first read that, when I was reading it and studying that before, I had no idea what that was talking about. It made no sense to me whatsoever. I mean, I, what are you talking about, God? What does that mean? But this is what God was saying. Uh, to, to boil all down, this is what God was saying. Satan tried to destroy what God had made perfect. Satan, and he did destroy what God made perfect, but he tried to destroy what God loved, and that was the human race. He said, I'm going to destroy this race so God can't use you. And then God says, watch how the human race ends up destroying you, Satan, because I'm going to send someone. He's going to be all human, and that all human is going to end up destroying you, is going to crush your head, and you're going to bruise him along the way. The Bible says later on that God made coats of skin for Adam and Eve. The Bible says something had to die. Blood had to be shed so that Adam and Eve's sin, their nakedness, could be covered. They, they needed a covering for their nakedness, their, their shame. They were ashamed to be in front of God. The Bible says that he had to kill an innocent animal to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness, their sin. You know, that's a picture. The Bible in Genesis chapter 3 right here is pointing to the cross where God is saying one day, I'll send someone to shed his perfect blood to make a covering for you. What Jesus, what God was saying here that I will, uh, I will cause a, a separation between your seed and her seed and I will, uh, this seed, this human will destroy you, Satan. Eventually we find out that, that would be Jesus. Jesus came all 100% God, came down to be 100% man as well. And when he died on the cross, he destroyed Satan's power. He destroyed what sin's power had on us. And now we can have fellowship with Jesus Christ because when we accept what Jesus did on the cross for us, when we ask him to be our Lord and our Savior, the Bible says Jesus makes a covering for us. That's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. And that's where you see Jesus in Genesis chapter 3. God did not destroy Adam and Eve immediately. He didn't destroy them at all. He made a way so that they could have fellowship with him again. That's the amazing God we have. And I'm sure hope that you'll take this into consideration. Think about what God has done for you and ask yourself the question, have I made this God my Lord and my Savior today? Talk to you later.